So the feed may not last. So the uh, feed may not last as long. Um, platform feeders, make sure you get some with some mesh or drain holes in the bottom so that the rain and snow, and, uh, the water can drain through. Uh, there's hopper feeders, which of course are covered with the roofs and the feed is pretty much well protected. You got combinations. This guy's got a hopper on top of a platform with a little suet feeder on the side there. So attract many types of birds. Window feeders. I love. I like using window feeders. They're pretty fun. Um, I've got one right on my window in my living room, and I can literally sit in my chair in my living room and watch the birds come in and feed. Um, they do not increase chances of window strikes. Uh, most window strikes happen between three and thirty feet of the window. So having a bird feeder on the window, you know, with uh, obviously within the three feet, um, does not increase the chance of window strikes. Um, and it's nice to be able to sit in my living room on a chair and just sit there and watch the, watch the birds come in and feed. There's a little titmouse there enjoying a peanut. Tube feeders are probably one of the most popular types of feeders. Um, I've got one of these in my yard as well. Uh, typically, you take the top off and feed it from the top. Mine, I, I like to get ones that you can take the bottom off as well uh, so that you can empty the feeder out completely and clean it in between fillings. Um, so many times you'll see people will let it go down to about an inch or so at the bottom and then fill it, go down an inch or so at the bottom. When you leave that stuff at the bottom, uh, it's the prime habitat for bacteria and funguses and molds to grow, um, you know, which obviously can harm birds. So it's a good time, it's a good thing to get one that you can really easily clean so you can do a good cleaning on it. And tube feeders also come for different types of feed. This one's made for thistles. It's got these goldfinches all over it. They love the thistle. Thistle socks, they do the job. Not very attractive, but they do the job. They attract the finches in there. Suet feeders, they're fun. I've got one on a big maple tree outside of my window as well. Uh, get all kinds of woodpeckers, nut hatches. Um, there's a da little uh, downy woodpecker, Virginia creeper. It's a curious looking little bird. And then, of course, hummingbird feeders. Um, if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have a lot of hummingbirds, um, you may need more than one feeder. Uh, the, particularly the males are quite, quite territorial when it comes to their uh, food source. Um, last month, I was uh, camping out in West Virginia and I was in this field where it was mostly uh, milkweed, common milkweed. And I was just walking through there, checking out all the pollinators. And I heard this, uh, this ruckus off to the side and there was hummingbirds and I looked and there was uh, two males fighting over one flower in this field of flowers. Um, so they are quite territorial. Uh, so if you do have, again, if you're fortunate enough to have lots of hummingbirds, more than one is probably a good idea. Different types of bird seed, you know, sunflower, niger or thistle, cracked corn, millet, safflower, black oil, sunflower seeds, many types of seeds you can use. Um, and then of course, you got these guys, you know, they like the, the seed as well. You know, it says, I'm sorry to bother you, but the bird feeder is empty. So squirrels are an issue, absolutely. Uh, when we used to do these classes live, I always had people ask about how to control the squirrels and get them out of your feeders and so forth. There are some things you can try. Um, you know, there, there's cages that'll go around your feeders, baffles, you know, cleanliness spinners. And we're gonna talk briefly about these guys, feeder style type of seed, seed additives. The cages here, now, these are, you know, the designs so that the holes are, are large enough the birds can get in there to the feed, but they're small enough that the squirrels cannot feed and fit inside there. So this is one way to help keep the squirrels from getting to your bird feeders. Baffles, um, they work, you know, you can see the squirrel, they're trying to climb up that pole and get around that baffle, it can't do it. You can even grease the poles. But if you have a setup like this, make sure it's uh, far enough from the trees that they just couldn't leap from the tree to land on the feeder. But this is a 
fairly decent way of helping keeping the, the squirrels off your feeders. Cleanliness. Um, I keep my feed, you know, in my garage, but it's in a sealed, sealed container. So nothing, you know, squirrels or any other critters can get to it. And, you know, try to be as neat as possible when you, when you fill these things. Um, Cause they're attracted to anything you, you spill as well. If you have a, a feeder that's on a horizontal line, um, again, you can take little, cut little lengths of hose and run along that line or thread spools. Um, so if squirrels try to climb across that line to get to your feeder, they spin and they cannot. Keeps them from getting to your feeder that way if you have it on a horizontal line. And feeder styles. Um, the one where the squirrel's hanging on the bottom of it, the, the perch bar there, when he puts his weight on it, it closes the door so he can't get to the food. The other one requires a battery. Um, the little feed ring on the bottom of it where a bird's perch, when the weight of a squirrel goes on there, it starts spinning and uh, helps keep him off of the feeder. And of course, types of seed. Squirrels are not really fond of thistle or safflower seed. And then seed additives. Um, birds do not have the same type of taste buds. They cannot perceive that the, the heat from hot spices and peppers and so forth like mammals can. Um, so you can add hot, sp hot spices to their feed and there's different repellents. And some of the feed come with the um, hot spices already in there. Does not affect the birds at all. They cannot taste it. And the birds don't like it. I mean, excuse me, and the squirrels are not fond of it at all. But really, um, you know, you can just learn to live with them. Uh, they are an integral part of the, uh, you know, of the ecosystem. Uh, and they're kind of fun to watch. They really are. Um, I got a pretty large wooded lot. I got squirrels. They really don't mess with my feeders too much. Um, there's plenty of things for them to eat. Uh, but when I lived in a development um, with a much smaller lot and houses all around and not too many woods around, I had actually put up squirrel feeders away from my bird feeders and away from my vegetable gardens, and make it as easy as possible for them to get food. And the thought was to keep them away from my vegetable garden and my bird feeders. And it did help. It did not help 100%. I'm not going to lie, but it helped tremendously. Uh, just make it as easy as possible for them to get food. Um, and hopefully they'll leave your bird feeder and your vegetable gardens alone. Even like the platform feeders we talked before, um, there's all different, we, you know, here at Maryville Garden Center, we sell this stuff called Critter Munch. Uh, just pour some of that on there and uh, again, make it easy for the birds, I mean, for, excuse me, for the squirrels to get to the food and hopefully they'll leave your feeders alone. Now, if you wanna attract birds in your yard and keep birds there all season long, again, bird feeders, are, I put them up for me. They're for me, for me to see the birds, not so much for the birds. This is what real bird food looks like. A little swallowtail caterpillar there. So to get these guys, birds to stay in your yard all along, you gotta plant the right type of plants that provide a food source for the birds. And Doug Tallamy's book, uh, Bringing Nature Home, he talks about uh, watching this, this, this family of chickadees and they would bring 230 soft celled a soft bodied uh, insects to the nest a day, 230 a day, that's a, that's a lot um, to feed the brood. They would not have nested in his yard if he didn't have the right plants planted in his yard that support this insect life, which the birds feed on. So when, you, when you're gardening for birds, you're gardening for butterflies, they go hand in hand. I mean, and it, 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 it's a great thing. Um, some of the, you know, common butterflies that most people are familiar with, you know, the monarch, and there's its larvae there. Um, monarch is one exception where the caterpillars are toxic to birds. They don't, they pretty much leave those guys alone. Um, this one, I just put this one up there because the, the caterpillar form is, is quite unusual looking. It's called a regal moth and the caterpillar is called the hickory horn devil. That guy is huge. Um, quite square, quite scary looking, but harmless. Um, that will feed a lot of baby birds. Uh, Sphinx moth, you know, we get those around the house quite a bit. Again, big, chunky looking caterpillar there. 
wavy lined emerald. Um, its larvae is tiny and it will take parts of its leaves and you know, the plant that he's feeding on and attach it to his body as camouflage. So a lot of times, you know, as you're out there looking to see what type of uh, caterpillars and so forth you have, these guys are very camouflaged, hard to see. And then the Eastern giant swallowtail, um, its larvae almost looks like a bird dropping. So as you're walking through your garden and you, and you might think you see a bird dropping, take a closer look, it's actually a caterpillar. Another great way to camouflage itself. So plant selection, when you're planting out your garden, it's very important to, to know what type of birds you wanna attract, what type of pollinators you wanna attract. Um, and for the most time, native plants work best. Native plants provide a better food source for birds. Um, when you're gardening for birds and pollinators, you know, you, you gotta look at plants as, as food sources as well. Um, for the birds, whether they eat off the plant itself, like its seeds and so forth, or whether they feed on the herbaceous insects that live on the plants. So what makes a plant native to Virginia? I like to say if it existed here before 1607, before Europeans settled in Jamestown. If it was here before then, then it's native. So native plants are good to use. I mean, they're adapted to our soil and our climate. They require less care and watering. They survive with less fertilizer and disease control, uh, unlikely to become aggressive, and they help control erosion. Promotes cleaner water because you're using less fertilizer and disease control. Uh, most importantly, native plants have co-evolved with the ecosystems, in the ecos have co-evolved with other species in the ecosystem. And uh, quite frankly, they, they grow here anyways, they're lower maintenance. So to keep birds in your backyard all season, you need to build a habitat for them. And birds are definitely more attracted to native plants. Take a lesson from nature. You know, trees and shrubs act as host plants as well as overwintering sites for food sources. You don't have to be so neat. Um, in your garden beds, uh, let the leaf litter build up a little bit. Um, it's a whole nother world living in that leaf litter. Uh, this is pretty quite amazing. Um, a lot of my different, you know, cone flowers and so forth. I let them go to seed. Um, you know, again, the finches love those guys. Um, biodiversity. Plant as many different types of plants as possible. It gives it a much more healthy garden. And in doing this, you know, you'll be providing food, water, shelter, and nesting sites, everything that birds will need. This is a sign uh, that they had posted up in Blandy Experimental Farm uh, up near Winchester. And it was on their native plant sale uh, trail, excuse me. Um, I just thought it was neat, asked if I can use it. It's, it's called Recycling is Our Business. And it talks about the decomposers in the soil, the diggers, the predators, all these little guys that live in the soil. Uh, and they call it their employees. It says, meet our employees. I mean, they work for them for free. You know, they're what makes the garden, they're what makes the garden work. Um, there is even a bacteria in the soil called. Um, uh, Mycobacterium bacchae, that when you come in contact with it, um, it almost acts like lithium. It makes you happier. Um, and when they've given it to uh, lab mice, they can actually find the uh, cheese faster than someone than a mouse that hasn't been come in contact with it. So when you're out there gardening, out there planting the dirt, just think, man, you're 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 making yourself happier and smarter. So it's a good thing. Know your yard, absolutely know your yard. Um, you know, is it sunny? Is it shady? Is it wet? Is it dry? Um, and when you're planting natives, um, you know, plant Virginia natives if possible, but also know your region. Um, you know, we've got different regions here in Virginia, the coastal plain, Piedmont, Blue Ridge, and so forth. So I'm assuming most of you guys watching this live in the Piedmont region region. Some of you may live in the Blue Ridge, um, but pick, pick plants that are specific for your region, not just the state of Virginia. I mean, and Virginia has, you know, many different hardiness zones. I mean, we got zone eight all the way down to uh, zone five. Um, and again, so pick uh, regional specific plants, you know, something that may grow down in Virginia Beach definitely will not grow up in Highland County and vice versa. 
this was uh, taken out of, again, out of Doug Calamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, and it's a list of different trees and a number of um, butterfly and moth species that use these trees as host plants. Oak trees, you know, 534 species use those as, as host plants. That's, that's incredible. Um, you know, willows, 455, um, popular, 368. I mean, this just goes on and on. Uh, maple trees, 285. Um, most people, when you think about uh, pollinators and butterflies and so forth, they think of uh, perennials and flowers and shrubs. Trees are a huge uh, host plant source for uh, butterflies, which in turn are food sources for the birds. And then again, uh, just a list of the, of the uh, some of the perennials, the goldenrod, saladago, 115 species use that as host plant and right underneath the sunflower, the helianthus, 73. And both of those guys are late summer into fall bloomers. Um, you know, they're, they're coming to life right now. They're out there blooming now. Uh, so when you're planting your garden, um, you know, try and get stuff that blooms in the spring, something that blooms in the summer, something that blooms in the fall, even into winter. That way something is going on all season long uh, for the pollinators. Um, so you always got a food source for them going all season long in your yard. Usually when I'm at work, a lot of times people will ask specifically about hummingbirds. Um, so the first couple of plants we're gonna talk about here are basically the, the, the top 10 for the mid-Atlantic region uh, to attract hummingbirds into your yard. Um, buckeye is one of them. Moist well-drained soil, full of port sun. They can be quite large. They can get 50 to 70 feet tall and they can make a really nice specimen tree. Um, even when they're not in bloom, the, the, the leaves are very nice looking. They're different looking. Uh, I recently saw a uh, photo of a customer of mine that uh, I sold her one uh, several years ago. And she brought a picture in and showed me just this past summer. And it's phenomenal. It is huge. And she took it when it was in full bloom. And it was just really, really nice. Some of the native rhododendrons, the Catawba Biens. Um, Hummingbirds really like these guys. Uh, evergreen shrubs, six to 10 feet tall. They can get quite tall. They can reach 20 feet tall. And they're, they can be quite dense under ideal conditions, um, but can become more open and dense shade. Canada lily, three to eight feet tall, full sun, rich, moist soil. 16 to 20 blooms on each plant. Cardinal flower. This is another really nice one for the hummingbirds. One to six feet tall. They bloom from September, July to September. Um, excuse me. They like moist soils. Part sun. They'll take full sun if there's adequate moisture. Typically when I see these, growing in the wild, they're underneath the canopy of, of most of the oaks and hickory. So they're getting filtered sun all day. These guys are almost exclusively pollinated by hummingbirds and bumblebees. Not too many other things will pollinate these guys. Pictured here is red, but they also come in blue. Columbine, that's another neat little plant, little understory plant. They get about two feet tall, part shade to full shade, moist, well-drained soils. And around here, where well, temperatures stay between 110 and negative 10, uh, they are evergreen. Indian pink. One to two feet tall, full to partial shade, medium to wet soil. Um, they start blooming in, in May or early June, and they'll go well into the fall. And if you look at those blooms, I mean, there's not too many things other than hummingbirds that can really get in there and pollinate these guys. Plus, it's just a really neat, interesting bloom. Spotted jewelweed. Grows in dense stands up to five feet tall, about five feet wide. They got translucent stems. And they bloom from July to October. Uh, we actually do not sell these here at Maryville Garden Center, but I included them because um, they are great for hummingbirds. Um, I've got some growing around my house uh, right outside my back door. And where they're growing, I can sit inside and, and watch them through the glass and they can't see me. 
And uh, they just really enjoy this stuff when it's in bloom. Uh, and again, it goes from July to October. So it's a great source, you know, a great late season source of nectar for them. Trumpet creeper. Vines can grow up to 30 feet. Uh, they, pink, they can be grown as a small shrub. Um, and they bloom from June to September. And again, they've got that, that tubular red look to them um, that the hummingbirds love. Um, they can become aggressive. Uh, they will produce those big long seed pods. Um, if you really don't want to spread them, just pick those seed pods off. Uh, but it's another great one for the hummingbirds. They really love this one. And then the trumpet honeysuckle, the native honeysuckles. Again, you got that tubular red, um, full sun to partial shade. Uh, they do get a little bit of uh, exfoliating bark. Um, blooms go from red to yellow in mid spring. And then when the blooms are done, uh, they produce a red berry, which the other bird species like to eat as well. So this is a good all around plant to have for birds. And our other feathered friends here. Crab apples, um, great trees for birds. Um, 29 species, 29 plus species of birds will feed on crab apples, you know, both a food source from the fruit and the insects and birds nest in them quite a bit. Dogwoods, 93 plus species of birds uh, feed on, on, on these berries on the, on the dogwoods. Uh, ripen in June, June, July, and August. And uh, they're also one that they like to nest in because of the branching structure. And really nice fall color too. People buy them for the blooms in the spring, but they got really nice fall color. Hawthorn trees. Again, nice white bloom spring. Nice white bloom in the spring. Uh, 39 plus species of birds feed on these guys. Uh, ripens in the fall. And most importantly, the, the, the fruit will persist all winter long through the spring. So it's a good food source all winter long. And it's another one that birds like to nest into. Winterberry hollies. 49 species of birds feed on these guys, 49 plus. Um, the fruits mature in fall. And again, these guys last through the winter. Um, we've got some planted on our uh, property at a Gainesville location uh, in front of the store. And it, it, it's, it's pretty fun to watch. And we'll just have like flocks of uh, wax wings come in there and just feed on these berries. Um, it's really fun to watch, watch all the birds gather these things in the wintertime. Junipers. Oh, speaking of winterberries real quick too, um, only the female plants will get the fruit. You do need a male and a female. Uh, to get the cross pollination to produce the fruit, but only the females will get the berries. Junipers, your cedars. 50 plus species of birds feed on these guys. Uh, of course, they use them for nesting sites too. They are evergreen. They eat the fruit and they use it as shelter. Uh, and again, this one as well, the female trees will get the blueberries on there, which, are, which the birds enjoy eating. Service berries, one of my favorite trees. Nice white bloom in the spring. 40 plus species of birds feed on these guys. Um, the fruit becomes ripe uh, first week of June, June 10th, somewhere around there. And if you've never tried them, they're actually quite delicious. They are really good tasting, uh, they taste really nice. Um, and the birds just love these guys. Uh, so if, if they let you, if, you know, if the birds let you share some, you can try some. They're pretty, pretty tasty. Black gums, another great tree. Um, 90 plus species of birds feed on these guys. Uh, they're called foli foliar fruit flagging, um, meaning that they're one of the first ones to change color in the fall and they turn a nice red. Um, they're heavy nectar producers. When they, First one's changing color in the fall as birds are flying down the uh, Atlantic or Appalachian uh, flyways migrating. They will see these trees changing color and they'll come down and feed on these trees. Uh, this is another one where the, it's mostly the female trees which will produce the fruit. Um, but both male and female have the flowers obviously and they're heavy nectar producers. 
Uh, they're also great for bees if you have beehives. Um, these are also called tupelo trees and tupelo honey is made from bees that pollinate these trees. Viburnums. There are several native viburnums out there. This is the maple leaf one. Um, 35 plus species of birds feed on these guys. The berries contain 41.3% fat content um, as a diet source for the birds. And most importantly, the, the, the fruit persists through the winter. Uh, this one pictured here is a black hall viburnum, uh, which obviously turns red and those berries are blue. Um, quite a nice looking plant. Bayberries. 85 plus species of birds will feed on these guys. Uh, the fruit persists into the winter. And again, it's a high fat content for the bird's diet. 50.3% fat content on these birds. These guys are evergreen as well. Um, they may lose some of their leaves sometimes in the winter time, but they'll hold on to some of them. Um, and the leaves, you, you crush the leaves and smell your hands and they, they smell really nice. New Jersey tea plant is another nice one. Um, full sun to part shade, needs a well-drained soil. It will tolerate some drought conditions. Um, birds feed on these guys, but they also feed a lot on the insects that, that, that live, off, live off of this plant. Spice bush. Um, some people call this the Forsythia of the wild. It's an early spring bloomer and it is yellow. Six to 12 feet tall, moist, well-drained soil, part sun to full shade. Um, only time I've ever seen this growing in, in, in full sun in the wild is when it was right next to a stream or a creek where there's plenty of moisture um, available for the plant. Um, they really don't like the full sun unless there's adequate moisture there. Um, but again, this is one where the berries are only on the female plants. And you can dry out these berries and grind them up and it makes an allspice, uh, hence the name spice bush. And this is the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail. Choke berries, nice white spring bloom, six to 12 feet tall, four season interest. Your fruit lasts until December or January. At the store right now, most of the choke berry are, the fruit are, is ripening now and the birds are just all over it. Um, it just, if you happen to go there shopping, go over to the section where we have the uh, choke berries and there's just birds all over this plant. It's a great plant to have for, for birds in your yard. Black-eyed Susans, two to three feet tall, dry, medium, well-drained soil, tolerates hot, humid summers like we have around here. And again, uh, I don't deadhead mine. Um, I let mine stay. Um, the birds love them. If you have to deadhead them, leave, you know, leave the dead, leave the dead flowers out there in the yard. Um, they, especially the finches really like to feed on these guys. American beauty berry, three to six feet tall and wide, full sun to part shade. Uh, fruits most abundantly in full sun. And these guys now, the berries are just starting to turn purple. This particular plant here, also produces a substance when it emits on its leaves that will actually help repel mosquitoes. Um, you can make a homemade mosquito repellent out of this plant. Uh, so you have an issue with mosquitoes, uh, you might wanna try this. This may help out with your mosquito situation in your yard if you have one. Summer sweet, or clethra. Full sun to full shade, but prefers part shade. It tolerates wet soils, tolerates clay soils. Uh, it's perfect for this area. Um, several varieties, most of them are white blooming. There is one called Ruby Spice, which is a red. Uh, they turn yellow in the fall. Um, birds will feed on the plant, but mostly they feed on the insects that live on the plant. One note about this guy, um, when they do bloom in summer, um, hence the name Summer Sweet, they are extremely fragrant. They're very fragrant when they're in bloom. And in the springtime, uh, I've noticed a lot of times they're about a month behind everybody else. So if you, when you get in the spring, when your garden's starting to wake up, things are starting to bloom and green up, you might think, oh, my summer sweet didn't make it. Give it time. It's about a month behind everybody else. Some of the native hydrangeas. Um, 
full sun only with constant moisture is available uh, the part shade blooms on new wood very intolerant of drought very intolerant of drought um, I included this because they're they're popular really the birds on the plant itself uh, only consist of probably less than five percent of a bird's diet of the plant but they do feed on a lot of the insects that that live on this plant um, so it's still again you know you got to look at plants as food sources whether they eat the plant itself or they eat the uh, insects that live on the plant. Nine bark, full sun apart shade, tolerates many types of soil, exfoliating bark, nice white bloom. Uh, again, probably first week of June or so, those blooms will turn into these red seed pods, which the birds will eat, in addition to eating the uh, caterpillars and so forth that live on this plant. These guys, I mean, they're cold hardy down to about negative 40. They love the full sun, more sun, the better. They're very hot top, you know, they, they'll take the heat. It's a good, tough, durable plant. Jack in the pulpit, interesting looking plant. I've always liked this plant since I was a kid, seen it growing in the woods. Uh, grows mainly, can, grows in many conditions, but prefers moist, shady areas. Um, and the birds just really enjoy the seeds on those things, the seed pots on those. Wild geraniums, um, full sun, the light shade, moist, to partially dry soils. Again, another one to tolerate full sun with constant moisture. So another one where the birds pretty, you know, the, the, the plant consists of less than 5% of the diet, but they feed on all the insects that live on this plant. Another great food source for the birds, keeping the birds around. Blazing star, uh, moist, drained soil, to drought tolerant, 12 to 48 inches tall, depending on the variety, and blooms in the summer. Bee bomb, full sun to part shade, prefers moist soil. Uh, I put on here divide after, divide after three or four years. Uh, if any of you guys have grown this before, um, it's a good idea to divide it. I mean, it, it can get pretty dense and grow pretty well. And this one actually, I probably should have included in with the hummingbirds as well. Hummingbirds like this guy as well, quite a bit. New England asters, um, full sun to part shade. Moist, well-drained soils, one to six feet tall, blooms late summer into early fall. Again, this is the one that will bloom later in the season, so you can get something blooming all season long in your garden. Blue stem. I like using grasses in the landscape. Uh, full sun, moist to slightly dry conditions, and they're somewhat beard tolerant. And believe it or not, even though it's a grass, there are six species of butterflies that use this as a host plant. Northern sea oats, they can tolerate very dry conditions to moist, well-drained soils, three to, feet, three to five feet tall. And those seed pods are producing, I mean, that's just, that's just ringing a dinner bell for the birds. Talk a little bit about nesting sites here. This is just a picture I pulled offline, just saw it on the internet. I just thought it was a neat picture. Um, somebody just nailed an old shoe up the side of a tree and wrens took it up as a, as, as a nest. Um, I've got a similar situation in my house where I've, I've got a carport where every year these wrens nest in, the, in a box in a carport and I just leave that box there for them. And a lot of times they'll do two broods. Um, they'll find the right place to, to nest. Bird houses, if you use bird houses, they're nice. Um, you do have to clean them out every so often. Um, usually with like a, uh, uh, one to 10 ratio of bleach and water. Again, this is another picture I just pulled off the internet. Uh, I just thought it was neat. Somebody had a, uh, a, a dead tree, you know, dead trees a lot of times are called snags. And rather than take it down, they made a little uh, birdhouse community out of it. Um, dead trees or snags um, are good, as long as they're not in danger of falling on anybody's property or car or house or anybody. Uh, if you can leave them up, leave them up. Um, they are a wonderful food source for birds uh, and all kinds of critters um, in the landscape. So if you're not in danger of hurting anybody or anything, and you can live with it, leave them up. It's, 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 it's a great thing for them to keep, help keep birds around, especially woodpeckers. 
Again, birdhouse maintenance uh, should be cleaned out at least once a year, one part bleach, nine part water, uh, and you know, clean out some of the nesting material in between broods to help reduce parasites. Water, birds absolutely need water. Um, birds temperature, body temperature is 105 degrees Fahrenheit and they don't sweat like we do. The only way they can uh, relieve heat is by panting. So they absolutely need water. So, you know, birds need water from drinking and bathing, you know, not too close to feeders, um, provided at varying heights, you know, no more than two inches deep. And birds are even attracted just to the sound of water. Again, this is a picture I found online, just thought it was neat, different ways to provide water for birds. And even this guy, big old barn owl, he needs to take a little dip every now and then. And varying heights. Um, again, just a picture I pulled off. It's just neat. Come up with help to help you guys get different ideas on how to provide water uh, in the landscape for for birds and butterflies. Thought this was neat. Somebody just used a lids at old galvanized uh, trash cans, turned them upside down, used those as a water source. And of course, all the different bird baths that you can use as well. And of course, here at Merrifield Garden Center, we've got all kinds of water features that you can put into your landscape. Again, you know, the birds are even attracted just to the sound of water. Uh, we'll bring them into your yard. So these are just a few of the birds um, that I've seen over the years here working at Gainesville. Um, the Garden Center, because of our, such a broad variety of plants, is, is really a nice place to go birding. Um, Goldfinches, see them every day out there, every day out there. Red starts, you know, Baltimore Orioles, Orchid Orioles, uh, Blue Grosbeak, Rose Breasted, Cedar Waxwings, those guys are out there every day. Common yellow throats. I don't see too many of them, but every once in a while those, those will fly in. Indigo bunting, see them in the summer out there. Uh, northern flickers. They're usually on the ground looking for worms. Scarlet tanagers. Those are really nice looking birds. Um, I get them in my yard as well. Um, they're a bird that I typically see, uh, excuse me, I typically hear more than I see. They're feeding a lot, way, way up high in the canopy in the treetops. Um, so again, you know, trees planting in layers are important uh, for attracting different types of birds. Um, that's a beautiful looking bird. So a quick recap. So choose feeders that are easy to clean, proper feeder placement to avoid window collisions. Again, the most collisions happen between three and 30 feet from a window. Uh, you can choose feed or for Pacific birds. But very importantly, birds do not exclusively feed from feeders. Again, I put my feeders up just for myself, just to get them to congregate in a central area so I can see them. And using native plants give more birds, give birds more healthier food options. Uh, mimic nature when you're designing your yard, plant in layers. Uh, provide shelter and nesting sites, whether natural or man-made. Birds need water. Uh, and most of all, enjoy what you have created. And there's just some recommended readings on there for you. And uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. Yeah. If you yeah. have a few minutes. I do, okay. I do, I do. Fabulous. Okay. First question. And I was about to write this person back, but we have some questions about bird feeders since they attract mosquitoes. Um, mm -hmm. I know you could change out the water frequently, but we also sell those mosquitoes dunks. Those are bird safe, correct? Do you, I know they, Pat here talks about them. Right. Yeah, they, they, they are, um, you know, one, one thing that I've done at my house, um, Obviously, the more birds you have, the more, you know, they're, they're going to feed on the mosquitoes as well. Yes, you, you can use those dunks. But one thing a lot of people don't think about what I've done at my house is I put up bat feeders as well. 
Um, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Put a, put a bat feeders in, and they they help with the mosquito issues. But yes, you can. Okay. Awesome. Good to know. Okay. Um, all right. Next question is about hummingbird nectar. Do you have any mm -hmm. recommendations about purchasing it versus making your own, or do you recommend using it at all? Um, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I purchase mine a lot of times just because it's a matter of convenience. I have made it before. Um, it's a matter of convenience. Um, when I did make it, I did not use the red dye. Um, of course, there's a lot of controversy of as, far, as far as the red color, food coloring, whether it's harmful for the birds or not. Um, one thing, though, especially in the hot months when they're here, summer and so forth, um, with the whether you make it yourself or whether you purchase it, um, you do have to change it out quite frequently. Um, you'll see that uh, the black mold sometimes can grow on the feeders. Um, and yeah, you have to change it out considerably because that mold is also harmful to the birds. But I, I don't have a preference. I, I, I buy it a lot of times just because it's a matter of convenience. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. And I think for anybody who has any questions about making that, I think we have a blog post on it. So feel free if you're interested in that to follow up with me and we can send you some information on that. Um, next question for people who want to support uh, birds or pollinators during the winter, do you have, mm -hmm. are there any blooming plants you recommend for that? Or is that kind of a time to focus on providing shelter, water, that sort of thing? Well, no, with the, not as far as the blooming plants, no, but there are, you know, there's plenty of plants we, we, we talked about that add food source for the, for the birds, you know, um, like the, the winterberry hollies, um, the viburnums, you know, all those berry producers where the, where the fruit persists all winter long. Okay. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, now, as far as, uh, you know, many of your, many of your uh, butterflies and so forth like that, you know, are not active at that time, you know. Um, but, you know, we, we talked about uh, uh, when you're planting your birds about not being so neat, you know, let that leaf litter build up in your beds and your garden beds. Um, there's a whole nother world going on on a leaf litter that provides all kinds of food uh, for, for birds over the winter, in addition to some of the plants. And, um, yeah, absolutely. Leaf litter, the, 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 the specific plants that are provided food source. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, quickly. Okay. I, it looks like I've got a couple more. Mm -hmm. um, I have someone who's asking about the difference between say, if you have a plant that maybe people, sorry, uh, pollinators or birds will come and feed hummingbirds will come feed on the nectar, but it's mm -hmm. not necessarily a host plant. Maybe it's not a native um, so it's not a host plant for caterpillars. Mm -hmm. Person mentions agastache specifically. Agastache. Yeah. Is that? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on should you still plant stuff like that? Do you, would you personally recommend avoiding planting things like that? Is there a balance? I actually like agastache. Um, the blue ones in particular. Um, again, at the garden center this summer, um, it was amazing the number of bumblebees that were on that agastache. It was just it. It's a huge, yes, I, I yeah. like that plant. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. okay. Yeah, so I know some plants aren't host plants, but they may still be. Nectar yeah. sources and soap, yes. They have, yeah, okay. I think that answers their question. Um, here's an interesting one. This person puts up bluebird houses. Mm -hmm. um, house wrens came and kicked bluebirds out from the bluebird house. They removed the nest the wrens were building. The bluebirds returned, laid their eggs. Is there anything that they can do to keep the wrens from bullying the bluebirds out of the bluebird house? See, the wrens are a small bird, so they can get down in that, you know. Yeah. The, the, the hole with the bird bluebirds fit in. Um, you know, I really don't have an answer for that one. I'd have to, I'd have to research that a little bit. Okay. You know, other, other than trying to... Um, you know, if, if you see the, the, the wrens checking out the, the nest, trying to, you know, scare them away. Um, I really don't have an answer for that one, I hate to say. Okay. All right. Yeah, we can uh, think on that. Someone just wrote, said, put up more houses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might help. Um, okay. Let me just check really quick, make sure we covered. I had a few people write in um, stuff like stock we have, which I can follow up with them. So you all feel free to email me if you have a question about stock. Um, 
Let's see. Oh, we had one one last question. Um, mm -hmm. Are any of these plant species that you're recommending appropriate to plant in the fall? I know trees and shrubs. It's a good fall's a good time. Perennials, I'm not so sure. So I said I would ask you if you have time. <laughs> Absolutely, we're we're in a prime planting time right now. Yeah, fall time. Yes. Excellent. Okay, yeah. that's great. Fantastic. Um, okay. Okay. One more question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, this is about the window collisions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a few times between preventing collisions between three and 30 feet. So is there right. something you are not supposed to place that close to a window or? That's, that's just like if you put your bird feeder in that range between three and 30 feet. Got it. That's, that's where most window collisions happen. Okay. Um, so you either want the bird feeder right up on the window or you want it farther than 30 feet away from your window. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. Excellent. I think we had a few people ask about that. So I think that takes care of it. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, Andy. I just want to remind everybody if for any reason I missed your question, um, or if you didn't get your question answered, if you have a question about stock for plants, uh, please feel free to hit reply on that email with your dial-in details, that goes directly to me. Um, I will either follow up with you or forward it on to Andy or a member of our plant clinic as needed uh, based on what, what your questions are about. Uh, we'll get you to the person who can help you. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Andy, thank you for joining us. Is there anything you would like to close with before we conclude? No, just thank you guys for watching. Um, hope you're having a great day and just get out there and enjoy your gardens. Absolutely. Thank you all. Sorry for my dog barking. Really quick, um, we will be sending out an email tomorrow with a coupon. Um, so keep an eye out for that in your inboxes. Thank you all so much for joining us today, Andy. Thank you. Everybody have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, everyone.